Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. <coughs> good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. So nice to be here. Lovely day. They tell us that there's a heat wave on, and it's going to be by the early part of the week um, down south as much as 30 or 32, up here about 25. It should do my son tan some, some good. <laughs> and um, so I look forward to that. Um, I, we just have, um, I have a message this morning that is going to be um, some thoughts, thoughts that uh, comes to Hank John, um, but hopefully by the Holy Spirit, because that is what we pray for, that we're led by the Holy Spirit. And uh, sometimes I like to do things a bit unconventionally. And, um, but the basis of my story is just part of Jonah. Jonah. I don't know what you think of the story of Jonah, other than singing about him and, and the whale, or him and the fish, or whatever, as the case might be. So Jonah, I don't know what page to tell you it is in the Bible, um, but it comes after Obadiah, which is only one chapter. And um, which comes after Amos, and so on and so on. And um, so it's wrong in the clean pages of the Bible, usually. Um, <laughs> that's what they say. And uh, we just read uh, chapter, chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, and leaned down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said one to another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, <coughs> For whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why? Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may become for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. Then he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jehovah, and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, 
and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. God had the richest blessing of his work to our hearts for his name's sake. Should we just have a little prayer as we consider some of these things? Father, we praise and thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that this word, which has so many times over the millennia, have, men have sought to destroy it, but cannot. Because we know, Father, that your word is eternal. And Father, we pray then that you would open it to us this morning. And as uh, we meditate on it, Father, meditate on what you have to say to us. Help us, Father, that we'll be not just hearers of the, of the word, but Father, doers of the word. Guide us and help us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I've been thinking for a while about Jonah, and I don't know how many times I've read it. It's only four short chapters um, in the Bible, and you can just read it in just a few minutes. But I find it a quite fascinating story especially having been um, a sailor um, for so many years and I could identify with that sea, that storm, that sea that he had. I could also kind of identify with him being in the fish's belly as well, <laughs> being in a submarine um, many a time uh, down there for, for weeks on end. And, um, but one of the things that um, also caught my eye during the past few days, I came across, um, you know, I wish I'd remember this lady's name, but I came across, um, she produces lessons for Sunday school, and it's come, they come from America, and, uh, and, and she, one of the lessons that was sent to me just a few days ago sort of caught my attention. And this is what she said, and I think it's good for us adults too. Um, and she asked a question, three questions. Do your kids know God? Do they know who God is? Do they know what God wants from them? And do they know what God will do for them. And you know, that really grabbed my attention. Um, do your kids know God? Do they know who God is? Do they know what God wants from them? Do they know what God will do from, for them? And her point was this, that we love to tell the children a lot of these fascinating stories about stories from the Bible, and like David and Goliath. And it could be that when we tell these stories um, that we become more caught up with the fact that there was this giant, nearly 10 feet tall, and there was this little lad who goes up to him and says, you know, I, I can take you down, sort of thing, and get carried away with the the story itself, rather than what the stories are teaching. Same thing for Noah and the flood. They will teach him about Moses. They will teach him about Abraham, and so on. But it's the meaning that is important, rather than whether there were five stones that David took, and whether they were round and smooth, or, or whatever. And it is quite true indeed, because when you think of um, David and Goliath, what was the big difference between David and Goliath? Right? What is the big difference? Because Goliath could have taken down David. He was much bigger, he was much stronger, as Saul told David. He was a man who was a warrior from his youth. He had experience that David didn't have. He had all the armament, he had size, he had everything. But the big difference, of course, was God. David said, could say to him, you come to me with swords and, and um, spears and, and a javelin or whatever, but I come to you in the name of 
the law of Israel. And that is the difference. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, do we Christians, adults, and many of us have been Christians for many years, but do we really understand who God really is? Why is it that we are such a curring, timorous, beastie, as Rabbi Burns would say, kind of people? And yet, when we stand together, we can move mountains. I mean, I, I was uh, asking Christine about this because I remember some years ago when they used to do this walk down in Delgetti Bay, raising money for cancer and so on. And Tesco's used to help them quite a lot. And I remember after one year, Tesco decided that they're going to shift their money from that kind of charity to it was LBGT things. And there was such an outcry about it. And there was such a big boycott of Tesco that you know they made huge losses that year. Tesco had to sell off a lot of their assets. I mean, because you know their profits usually run into billions or something like that. So when they make losses, they make losses big time, you know. And then just this past week, I think I've forwarded this to to some of you, um, the because of the um, the uh, yeah Disney has taken on this LBGT thing big time, and they want um, every film they produce now to have. Um, romantic. In fact, in, in this one, the latest one was called um, Lightyear, which is from the Buzz Lightyear series. Um, Lightyear. And in it, um, they had two women, of course, forming this kind of liaison and, and romantically <coughs> kissing and so on. And there's a big outcry about it, uh, mainly from Christians, right? Well, I'm standing here this morning and I'm very pleased to tell you that Disney has lost a lot of money. Um, on the launch of Lightyear. And I, I don't make any apologies for that because why Christians stood up for what they believe. And we are living in a time, and, and John, um, this morning at the, at the Breaking of Bread service, was uh, reminding us um, the days that we live in and what we as Christians. Um, could have called upon to do. And we, we have, to me, a choice of one of two things. Either we could go and cover down in a corner and say, just leave me alone, right? Or we stand up as Christians and say, enough. Because what is the difference between us and the Disney's and that of this world? Who? God. That is the difference. And if we really believe that we have the Holy Spirit living in us and that he wants to work in us and if we allow him to work in and through us just think what we can do because why we have God and our side I came across a shocking statistic um, a few days ago as well, which said that over 90%, over 90%, I forget exactly, I think it was near 95 or something like that, but I'll say, just to be in the same spot, <coughs> over 90% of Christians have no contact with God or His Word between Sundays. So there are many of us who go to church on a Sunday and then we go home and we put our Bibles away and then there's nothing more about God until they come up next Sunday. And um, I, I just can't understand it, you know. And uh, Christine and I, we, 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 we use every moment to pray. We have a cup of coffee and we hold hands and give God thanks for it. And if at that time we could think of any um, body who we have promised to pray for, we pray for them. Even in a restaurant. Why not? I would love for somebody to come over and say to me, Oh, I see you're Christians. I say, Amen, brother. Are you a Christian too? 
what a witness that that would be. So brothers and sisters, we have nothing to fear. The world is getting on with its agenda. The only problem is they are attacking our children. And we have to be very much on our guard. We can either hand them over to these people or we, we stand firm and make sure that our children are firmly taught. So I could understand what this lady is getting at when she said, telling the children these Bible stories, as fascinating as they are, is not good enough if it does not include God and what he means to them. And they need to grow up knowing who God really is. And because I love to know and I love to read these chapters, I would, I would make no apologies at all for referring to them because I love, love, absolutely love reading John chapter 1. What beauty, when we want to know who God really is, John 1 and Hebrews 1 are the good two chapters. So poetic. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. <coughs> Through Him, all things, not some things, all things were made without him. Nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. And then, just skipping a verse or two, it says, the true light, in verse 9, gives light to everyone who is coming into the world. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, or of human decision, or a husband's will, but of God. And listen to this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And Hebrews, I just love Hebrews, and I love Hebrews particularly, um, <clears throat> I think it is, and if Charles were here, he would agree with me, um, I love reading it from the authorized version. Remember it, John? God, right, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Then it's beautiful words, I tell you. And then, and then it goes on to say, spoken by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had pur uh, provided purification for sins, he sat down. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. That's who the God that I serve is. So the question is <clears throat> that's been put there for us is um, what does God want from us? What does God want from us? And I put it down in one word. Obedience. Obedience. It is the lack of obedience of mankind that has got us all in this mess. Like Laurel and Hardy, one of them used to say, that's a fine mess you've got me in. 
you know, and I could just imagine that Adam saying that to Eve. Disobedience, that's what it was. And we see it here too, <coughs> excuse me, we see it here too with Jonah. So the Lord says to Jonah, look Jonah, the wickedness of those people over at Nineveh has come right up to me and I want you to go and do something about it. I want you to go and preach to them, right? So what does Jonah do? Instead of going that way, he went that way. And I was lucky enough to see, we know where Nineveh is. It's right up there in Iraq, which is not so very far from Israel. Tashish, on the other hand, there seemed to be the majority of students' agreement that it is over by Spain. And you know, Spain has got to the southern part of Spain, there's Gibraltar. And then just across from Gibraltar is Morocco. It's a very narrow strait, right? But they reckon that Tashish was not on the inside of the Mediterranean, but on the outside of that, on the Atlantic side. So it's as far as he could go then in the then known world, right? To get away from as far from God as he could. I think we all know by now we cannot hide from God. Not even in the fish's belly. Not even in a submarine. And I can tell you from my own experience that God is down there too. David puts it um, very beautifully. And I just I just love reading these scriptures and, and you probably know what, what I'm, I'm thinking of. And um, <clears throat> Uh, Psalm 130, 139, and it says this, <clears throat> You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know me when I sit, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay a hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And here is the question in verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle in the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast, and so on and so on. Them again is beautiful words. You know, and David knew this, of course, that God is everywhere. So Jonah, I'm sorry Jonah, but you cannot get away from God. And I wonder if this morning that any of us here are running away from God for any reason at all. That you feel that God has spoken to you and is asking you to do something for him. But for some reason, you don't think that you can do it. You know? And if that is the case, well, start by speaking to one of us. Let us know what you feel that the Lord is saying to you. And we'll pray with you about it, and we'll help you, won't we, John? Yes. Of course we will. Mm. And, um, and that is it. So sometimes, mm. you know, God puts an idea in our hearts and a work that is to be done that none of us is seeing, right? And so we need to be obedient. We need to be obedient. So Jonah goes off and he um, he's heading towards Tarshish, or so he thinks. And then the Lord of all creation causes some really stormy seas, so much so that these seasoned sailors thought that the end had come. And I like that uh, part of the story um, when you know they said that um, they go and wake him up. And they said to him, what, what do you mean? 
falling asleep. Can you not see we're practically sinking? There's a similar story like that with the Lord and, and his disciples and the Sea of Galilee, isn't there? And it goes to him and they say, Lord, and, and I find this a very interesting question. Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? Of course he cares. Of course he does. They come to Jonah. What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. And of course, we live in a world where there are many religions and many of them, I think the Hindus have, is it 5,000 gods or something like that? You know, and people, everybody have their gods and a god for this and a god for that and they don't know the only true and living God. Folks, that is up to us to let people know who God really is and the God that we serve. We do not belong to a secret society. I remember meeting a lady one time ago and, and I asked her, I said, are you a Christian? And she said, uh, that's a bit private, isn't it? I said, no. I said, the last thing the Lord asks us to do is to be a witness for him. So we spoke and she said, well, I suppose you're right. <laughs> well, the truth is, we're not, we're not part of a secret society. So Jonah is told to arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us. And look at this. Look at this. So they cast lots, the Lord fell upon Jonah, and, and they said to him, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? Where is, where is your country? And of what people are you? And of course, Jonah confesses. He said, I'm a hero. And I fear the Lord. Really, Jonah? I fear the Lord, he said. The God of heaven who made the sea and, and, and the dry land, which we can't see at the moment. But uh, yeah, he, he made it all. And listen to this. The men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For they knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What should we do to you? Of course, Jonah says, Well, throw me over the side and it will be okay. And he didn't want to do that. But what I find very interesting, and it seems to me that there was a bit of a, a revival on the ship on the boat, whatever it was. And this is, this is what they're saying. After they've given in, they couldn't get the boat back to land. In verse 14, they, therefore they cried out to who? The Lord Jehovah, not their God. They're calling now to the Lord Jehovah. We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. Do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done it as pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. What does the Bible tell us about the fear of the Lord? Is the beginning of wisdom. They feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord. It was so calm they were able to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. How wonderful! Isn't that wonderful? Right? So now God is on the board. Right? Because these men have, it seems to me, trusted the Lord and and I, I think I'm going to meet them in heaven one day. In fact, I'm looking forward to meeting Jonah. There's a few questions I would like to ask Jonah. And then Jonah, of course, we're told that God prepared a fish. Now, folks, we live in a world, and, and, and it, this, I, I received this email. It comes in from Cora. I, I don't know if you know, Q-U-O-R-A. You probably know of it. And sometimes people ask, uh, biblical question. And there's always this man from Australia who seems to know everything about the Bible, but he doesn't believe a word of it. And he answers, I don't know why it is, I don't know how, but he gets in there and he really annoys me. 
and he speaks about how all of this is fiction. You know, it was written by so much later because they can't believe that people as far back as Jonah lived, which was just around 780 BC, right? 780 BC. They can't believe that, that they could write things like this. It was written much later, you see, and it is just fairy stories. Not at all. Not at all. Every word of it is true. And we're told in God's word that God prepared a great fish, a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And you know, just in closing, I just want to read his prayer. He says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, or hell, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet will I look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me even to my soul. The deep pools round about me. Weeds were wrapped around my, my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. That is the very bottom of the sea. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you in your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord speak to the fish. You try speaking to your goldfish at home. I have tried. I stand there when we used to have one. I'm going. No, not interested. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. And then the story goes on. It's so very interesting. And uh, how that the Lord came a second time to Jonah and said, you must go to Nineveh and preach the message that I have told you to preach. And Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. It to, and it said it was a big city. And Nineveh was a very important place in the days of um, the Assyrian Empire. And of course, Jonah went and a kind of a, I want to think that, um, this is probably the topic of a sermon. I don't know. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. You could just imagine somebody walking through Kelty, you know, and saying that, you know, and you think, oh, is it just a not case? Um, but however, he must have preached something because we told the people of Nineveh believed God. What they did? Indeed, indeed, they repented. They repented. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them, the animals, the king came off his throne, and so on. And when is the last time you and I have repented of anything? You know, we talk about repentance with, with respect to coming to know Christ as Savior, that there needs to be repentance. They need, we need to turn away from the direction, we need to turn around from the direction that we are heading into and ask the Lord into our lives and he comes to live in us. But you know, repentance is a thing that we should be doing quite regularly because we make mistakes, we sin. We need to ask forgiveness. You ask Johnny, he could tell you about forgiveness quite a lot. He's an expert in it according to him, right? But, uh, but the truth is that we, we need to repent. We need to turn around from the direction that we're taking. We need to repent of any wrongs that we have done and ask the Lord to forgive us. And he sees a contrite heart and he forgives us. But Jonah, oh Jonah, he was not happy. People repented and he said, and he imagine that, coming to God and saying, I knew it, I knew it all along. 
that you are a merciful and gracious God and ready to forgive. And you've put me through all of this. Why haven't you destroyed that wicked law? You know, and sometimes that is how we feel. That is how we feel about the world we live in. God, why don't you just come down and judge them? God, they're destroying your creation. They're telling us that a man is no longer a, a man just a man and a woman is no longer just a woman. They, look at what they're doing to your creation, God. Would you just judge them? That is how we would feel about it. But we need to remember too that God is gracious to us too. God is merciful to us too. And God loves us. And you know what? He loves that lot as much as he loves any one of us in here this morning. And that is the truth. So brothers and sisters, let me just leave it there. There's a lot more I wanted to say. And I would say to you, there is nothing like trusting and obeying God, our gracious God. There is nothing like serving him. As he put something on your heart, please let us obey. Soon we're going to have the children's um, outreach up there. Do you need more help, brother and sister? Yes, indeed. Right? So they need more help. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to sit back and do nothing? Because those children need to hear about Jesus. And if we don't tell them, who will? Right? And I'll leave that challenge with you. And um, I'd like us to sing a hymn now then, please. <laughs>